tonight. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for your grace. Thank you tonight that as we examine this subject of grace, God, that you open the eyes of our understanding. God, we being enlightened may know the hope of our calling, the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of your power toward us who believe. Tonight, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that this is not Pastor Dan, this is not a man, woman, young, old, black, white, brown, this is not anything like that, God. This is about us coming together and hearing from you. So Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even your correction, Lord. And Father, we welcome it. We receive it in Jesus' name. Tonight, Lord, give us practical things that we can apply to our life. And God, may we have those aha moments with your word tonight as we unpack this huge subject, God, of your grace. We thank you, Father, that tonight, God, that uh, there's gonna be instruction. There's gonna be wisdom that goes forth. There's gonna be words of knowledge and words of wisdom that, God, we personally receive. God, how awesome you are, Lord, that you can speak to every person individually right where they're at. And God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Also, Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. We'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel. We ask that you would bless them and be amongst them as you bless us and are amongst us tonight, God. We pray, Lord, for the persecuted church scattered abroad throughout the world, that you watch over them, strengthen them, encourage them, bless them, guide them, deliver them, Lord, and may they endure to the end to the glory of God. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say... Amen. Tonight, get your Bibles out and go with me to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. This is our grace series, and this is actually part number three, and tonight we're going to be talking about sanctification, okay? It's a big word, it's a Bible word, and it's something that I think many of us, if we were to talk about, we would probably have maybe a limited understanding at best about this subject of sanctification, Let me rewind your thinking a bit because I'm going to build upon some principles tonight as we go through the Word of God, Uh, being that this is a series we've already come through, part number one and part number two. In part number one, we defined what grace is. Before we go any further, before we talk about what grace is for, you have to know what it is first, right? And we talked about whether it's just unmerited favor, whether it's just God's riches at Christ's expense, that grace, the definition of grace has to apply not only to us, but it also has to apply to Jesus. And so we found out that Jesus, by the grace of God tasted death for everyone, right? So what did that mean? That mean that Jesus had grace in order to do something. So we found out that this was grace, God's sovereign. If you know the definition, say it with me, God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. That's how we define grace, and we see that all throughout the Word of God. We saw that when it came to the Apostle Paul. He said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because God said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So we know that God uses these terms synonymously. God's power is also God's grace. It's his sovereign, divine ability, say with me, to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Then in the second part, last time we were together talking about grace, we talked about that the grace of God actually gave us a gift called salvation. That this is a free gift. We were justified. We were removed from the crime scene, if you will. That the gavel of heaven has come down and declared us to be not guilty because of the grace of God. That now that old man has died and the new man has been raised again to life. And that we receive this gift of God for salvation through faith, right? Through the grace of God. It didn't come from our efforts, but it came through Christ's effort and through my faith in his finished work. But we also found at the very end of that message that we can render the grace ineffectual. You remember the Bible term was that we could receive it in vain. In other words, you can receive the grace of God. You can have the grace of God, but you can receive it and not do anything with it, and you can frustrate or you can receive it in vain. In other words, it didn't have any effect in your life. It it, it was a lost cause. And therefore, I want to build on that thought tonight when it comes to grace for sanctification. See, we don't want to work against the grace of God, but we rather want to work with the grace of God. Now, this may be a new concept for some of you because some of you have been taught that grace does everything and that there is no personal responsibility on our part when it comes to the grace of God, that all I have to do is just believe I receive it, therefore I have it, and now I can do anything that I want to do, and grace will just cover me, that grace will just take care of it, grace has already done it all, that God's grace will just work it all out, and that I don't have any personal responsibility. But when I take a look at what I see in the Bible, I see something very different. First Corinthians chapter 1, are you there? 
Right off the bat, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 2, look at what it says. To the church of God, which is at Corinth. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to church people. Okay? Very important that we understand who he's writing to. He is writing to people in church. Tonight, we are preaching to people who are sitting in church. Okay, very good. Good. Glad you guys are tracking with me. To those who are sanctified... In Christ Jesus. Now there's that word that we're talking about. Sanctified. Let's read on and see what it says. Called to be saints. Everybody say saints. So not just people sitting in church, but there's a difference now. He calls them something. He calls them saints. With all who in every place call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. In verse number three, he starts out grace to you. Now, let's stop right there. He says that they are sanctified. And he says that they are saints. Two different words, but both of them have the same root. In other words, it'd be like if I was to say, you have been, uh, you know, tanned, and you are tan. Okay? Tanned and tan are two different words, but they have the same root, right? Somebody went out to the beach, they got sunburnt, and they came back, and they are, they are tan, but they were tanned, right? So he says, sanctified, but also saints. It's the same root word. That root word is a word that we get our term for being called holy. Maybe you've heard that term in church before. Maybe you haven't really understood. You knew that God was holy. You knew that we were supposed to be holy as he is holy. But then in the practical sense of what that actually means, you might have said, well, I I really don't know. You know, maybe maybe it means um, that we're supposed to be like God. Maybe it means that we're supposed to, to act like God or think like God. And I would say yes and amen to all of those things. So what does it really mean? What does it really mean? To be holy means that you are exclusively God's. That's the simplest way that I could think to put it. It, it, it means that uh, it, it carries the idea that you are set aside, right? So let's say that I had bought a pack of Oreo cookies, And I was going to share those Oreo cookies, except for five of them, I was going to keep those for myself. So I took those, and I put them in a baggie, and sealed that baggie, and I set them on the top shelf where my little kids couldn't get to, right? Because I got three little ones at home. And I set those aside for me later, right? You all can eat all the cookies, but those ones are holy. (laughs) See what I'm saying? They're exclusive to me. Those are mine. Right? If we are holy, we are set aside as gods. Not only that, but there is a separated purpose. There is something that, that is uh, exclusive about us. That means we are exclusively His. We are exclusively His design and doing exclusively His will. In other words, I'm going to eat those cookies later for my own pleasure. Right? Everybody understands the illustration? Those cookies are there to make my taste buds feel good later. Those are mine. Uh, They're set aside, they're set apart for me, and they're going to make me happy later on, right? See, if we are holy, I'm not saying God's going to eat us, okay, so just, you know, get that imagery out of your thinking, right? But if we are holy, that means we are set aside for God's purposes and God's pleasure. We are exclusive to God. Now, here's where we get messed up. It's because remember, God told the children of Israel, be separate, come out from amongst them, and be my people, I will be your God. You are to be holy unto the Lord, right? And so the Israelites in the Jewish nation, they separated themselves from the people so much so they wouldn't even intermarry, they, they, they wouldn't talk to certain people, there was prejudices that went on that, that came with that, and you can see that all throughout the Bible. That's the extreme version of that. But now that we are in Christ, now that we have been sanctified and we are holy unto the Lord, the apostle says, hey, listen, you you live still amongst the people. You're in the world, but you are not of the world. Otherwise, you would have to be taken out of the world, right? So he said, I'm not saying that you should shun every, you know, like like you should stay away from people who are doing these things, but, but you can't disassociate with everyone on the planet. That would mean at the gas station you couldn't talk to anybody who wasn't saved. That would mean at the, the restaurant you couldn't be served by anyone who's not a Christian. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. But you are separated from the world. You are set apart, and you have a holy call. You have an exclusive calling. You have an exclusive purpose. You are exclusive unto God. My life is not for me. It's not for my pleasure. My life is for him and for his pleasure. Now, remember I said that the word saint 
carries the same root meaning. That means that a saint would mean being one who is exclusive to God. Everybody tracking? So far, so good? Now, I want you to think for a moment about somebody who maybe was born of a noble lineage, right? There was a king and a queen. King and the queen are in love, and they have a child. Let's say they bear a son. That son is now heir to the throne, right? The moment that son is born into this world, he is nobility, okay? He is royalty. He has everything inside of him to become a king. He's going to grow. He's got 10 fingers, 10 toes, right? All that kind of stuff. They see that he's got his hair, his eyes, all that goodness, right? The five senses are going on. He's eating. He's, he's, he's living his life. He's learning. He's growing. But at the moment of birth, he is not yet the king, right? He is royalty. He is nobility, but he is not yet acting like who he is. See, he has to grow up in a process of time in a process of learning, in a process of changing. See, there's going to be attitudes and behaviors when he's a baby that are not fitting a king. You don't poop your pants and pee your pants and all that kind of stuff when you're king, right? People would look at you like you're crazy. He wouldn't be spitting up and belching and all that kind of stuff as king. That, that wouldn't be becoming of royalty. No, there's a, a certain protocol for people who are nobility, how they should act, how they should live, how they should talk, right? As a child, that royal person is still not the king, right? You don't run around the, 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 the castle as king. You don't slide down the stairwells as king. You don't do all, see, you wouldn't get involved in that kind of mischief as king. But that little one would be learning, would be growing, would be becoming who he is. In the process of time, in the process of growth, and at the right time, he would become who he is. For all of us, we need to come into this understanding that in the same way, we are born again. There is a reality of who we are in Christ. We are kings and we are priests here on the earth. But as we're born again, we're still living in this flesh body. And so we're not going to act like who we are right away. There's going to be behaviors. There's going to be things that come out of us that are not in line with who we are yet. And in the process, we will become that. That is the process of practical sanctification, not a separate act. It's not you're going to be sanctified and there will be a second act of grace that comes upon your life. No, this is a process. This is something that you are sanctified. You are set apart for God's holy. Right, I set the cookies aside for my holy purpose, but there will come a time where I go get them and pull them out of the bag and I eat them, right? So there is a process that we go through in the same way. There is time, there is testing, there is learning, there is growth, there is understanding, there's wisdom, there's direction, there's correction. There's things that take place in our life that go through this process of sanctification, okay? That means that we are sanctified, but it's going to be a process for us to start acting like it, okay? Clear as mud? All right, good. Now, for those of you who are having a hard time with this, I drew a graph, okay, to help you understand this, all right? I I show on one side identity, okay? That is the positional truth of who we are, okay? So on this side, you've got your identity, the positional truth. This is who you are in Christ. The moment that you are born again, you now have a new identity. You are no longer that old sinner. Now you are a saint, right? You are sanctified. You are set apart. You are holy. You are in him. Now on the other side of that, we have the lifestyle or the behavioral application, okay? And that means that how you live is the behavioral application. That is Christ in us, okay? So the identity portion, the positional truth is who I am in him, But then the behavioral application is how I live, Christ in us, right? So when I'm in Christ, when I understand the in him realities, now I understand my identity, who I am in Christ. But then who Christ is in me is the behavioral application. That is where the grace of God comes in and helps us to live how Christ wants us to live. On our positional side, it is grace gifted. You are sanctified. It is a gift when you are saved and sanctified. You are set apart for God's holy purposes. You are exclusively his. That is a positional truth and that is a positional gift. Okay? But on the behavioral application of that, that is grace manifested or appearing. That's grace being shown in and through your life. Okay? On the identity side, the positional truth, this is instant. Bang, it's an event. When you are born again, when you are saved, now you become a saint. You are now holy unto the Lord. That is your instantaneous event, right? That happened. I got born again. I got saved. I got sanctified. Uh, I'm a saint now, right? That, that was an event. That happened, bang, in a moment. But 
on the other side, the lifestyle application, the behavioral application of that is that this is progressive. It's a process. Both of these are simultaneously true. Okay? We see this often throughout the Bible, this dual uh, understanding, this dual reality. See, righteousness, it's both a position and a practice. It's the right wisdom, the right way of God. That it's, it's not only our position that I have a right standing with God, but also it's the right application that I can do right living because of the way that God tells me to live. That is the righteousness of God. So sanctification, being set apart, is a position. I am set apart, but it's also a practice. I've got to set myself apart. Everybody understand it? Okay, we see this in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 through 3, right? If you read the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 through chapter number 3 is all about who you are in Christ and what Christ did for you. That now, by, by faith, you've been saved through grace, right? It's, it's the gift of God. It's been given to you. Jesus Christ broke down the middle wall of separation. Now you've been brought into the family. You're no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens. This is who you are. This is what Christ did for you. It's the positional truth. But then, chapter number Four, chapter number five, and chapter number six is clean up your act. Stop lying. Don't cheat. Don't steal, right? And all of a sudden, he's telling you how to be married. He's telling you how to wage warfare. It is the practice of the truth because of what Christ has done in you. In fact, I love what uh, Eugene Peterson had to say about the book of Ephesians in his, in his intro and the, the message paraphrase that he did. He said, what we know about God and what we do for God has a way of being broken apart in our lives. The moment the organic unity of belief and behavior is damaged in any way, we are incapable of living out the full humanity for which we were created. I like how Pastor Deborah says this. Pastor Deborah says in her definition of grace that it is God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. When you look at grace for sanctification to be set apart for God's holy purpose, grace is God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. When I see in the word of God to be holy as he is holy, that can be overwhelming. In fact, some of the translations say, be ye perfect as I am perfect. That right there could crush anyone, right? I can't be perfect, right? Nobody's perfect. Jesus is the only one who is perfect. He was sinless. He was spot. I messed up. No way I can be perfect. But you can be set apart by the grace of God. You can do this because God wouldn't tell you to do something if he wasn't also going to give you the power and the ability to do it. That is the grace of God to set you apart and be holy. It's God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. In other words, it's by the grace of God that we can live a holy life. God gives us the power we need to live separated, to be exclusively his, and to clean up our act and be pleasing to him. If we only focus on the positional side, we will end up in sin. That's a hard thing to say, but it's the reality. And I've seen it play out on more than one occasion with more than one group of people, with more than one uh, movement, with more than one pastor, with more than one uh, uh, church. You know, I, I have seen it. And, you know, I've been pastoring for about 12 years now. And in that time, there have been waves that have come through. Some have been bigger than others. But I have seen as people focus just on who I am, the positional side, without the practice of it, practical holiness, they get messed up and they get off. Because they distort the grace of God, they, they, they receive it in vain, they, they don't really understand, or they think, well, I just don't have to do anything now. I am holy, and that's just how it is forever and ever, and that's just all I need to know, and that, that, that was all I needed to do was just believe, and, and now God makes up the rest, and I can live however I want. No, God is very interested in how we live our lives, and we will give an answer before the Father. You may be saved, but when you go to heaven, God's going to ask you, what were you doing messing around like that? Is that how Christians act? Is that how kings Act, is that how priests act? Yeah, that's who you are, but how you live didn't line up with who you are. Jude chapter 1 verse 4, turn with me in the book of Jude. Right before the book of Revelation, you'll find the book of Jude. If you have some time, Maybe read through the book of Jude. He's saying, I I really wanted to talk to you guys. This is how he opens up his book. He says, I really wanted to talk to you guys about our common salvation. I really wanted to write to you guys about this. He says, but I, I, I found it necessary that I have to talk to you about something else. And I and I have to contend for the faith. 
at this moment because of what's going on out there. See, it would be great for us just to talk about our position and our practice tonight. But I really feel because of some of the things that have been going on, we have to contend for this. And look at verse number four. It says, in verse number four, and you know what, I'm going to read this in a different translation because I, I like the, the way that it brought this out. Jude 1, 4, I believe this is the New Living Translation. He says, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of sub- such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So he says, I wanted to write to you about salvation, but I have to write to you about this because people have wormed their way into churches and they have distorted the grace of God, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. Other translations say they turn the grace of God into lewdness or they use it as an excuse to do gross things. Another translation says they use it as a license for evil. In other words, Hey, why are you messing around? Grace, that's my license. See, I can do this. It's fine. It's all right. I've got a badge called Grace. Don't worry about it. Hey, wait a second. Christians don't do that. Oh, Grace, it's all good, right? Well, wait a second. I thought we weren't supposed to. No, Grace, right? They use it as a license for evil. In, in fact, I like what Lord Ravenhill said. He said, or Leonard Ravenhill, I should say. He said that uh, many times when people don't like something in the church, they call it legalism. They start crying, oh, well, you're just legalistic. Right? We're under the grace of God. We're no longer under that. And so they start to argue, we're no longer under the law, which is absolutely true, guys. We, we are no longer under the law. We do not have the sacrificial system. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. He, he made the once and for all sacrifice. There is no other sacrifice coming. There is no other blood that can sanctify you and set you apart. There is no other sacrifice that no one else can save your soul. It is done. It is finished at the cross. Okay? We are no longer under the law. But that doesn't mean that we don't have any personal responsibility. And that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we should shun or things that we should do and things that we should not do. That is not law. That is liberty. Romans chapter 6. Turn there with me. Romans chapter 6. Let's talk about it. Romans chapter number 6. The apostle Paul is writing and he's saying, guys, the more... He he starts out in in chapter 5 and he's talking about the more uh, sin abounds... Even more so, grace abounded. In other words, you can't be so bad that it'll keep you out of heaven, right? There's not going to be something that you're going to do that's so bad, so shocking to God, that God says, oh, the blood of Jesus isn't strong enough for that, right? You you can't mess up too much to keep you out. Just like you can't work your way and be good enough to get in, right? It has to be by faith in the blood of Jesus, and then the grace of God steps in. It's a gift, right? But you can't frustrate it. You can receive it in vain. And so he says, well, wait a second. So, so then some would say, shall we sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, right? And then he drops down in verse number 15. Turn, the, turn there. Romans chapter 6, verse number 15. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Guys, this is 2,000 years ago. How come nothing has changed? Are people not reading their Bibles? Because it's right there in plain English. Shall we sin because we are no longer under the law? Certainly not. In other words, that is not an excuse. That is not a license or a badge to say, well, I can do whatever I want to do because grace. It's okay, grace. No, it's not. You should not sin. In other words, willfully turn away from and miss the direction of where God would have you to go. That is sin, where you're missing the mark. Now, you have sinned. You have willfully rebelled and turned away. He says, shall we do that? Shall we turn away from what God tells us to do and what God tells us not to do just because we're no longer under the law? Certainly not. Verse number 16, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? In other words, obedience, when you obey the word of God, it leads you to the right position and the right practice of what God says. As you flee from sin and as you sanctify yourself, set yourselves apart from the world, you are no longer a sinner. Many churches teach you, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Listen, no, you're not. Positionally, you are a saint. You are set apart. You, are, you were a sinner, yeah, but now positionally, I'm no longer a sinner. I'm a saint. 
So then why do we still sin? Because we're in the process of cleaning up our act. We're being sanctified. We're setting ourselves apart from those things. We're learning. We're growing. And that's why if you mess up, repent. In other words, change your mind. Change your direction. I was going this way and I realized I was wrong. And so I turned from my direction 180 degrees away from that. And I went back towards what God's direction is. And I'm no longer going to present myself as a slave to sin. No, I'm going to present myself as a slave to righteousness. As a slave to God. I'm going to allow God to come. I'm going to yield to his will and his way. And he's going to lead me to his righteousness. That position and that practice of what God wants me to do. That is our sanctification. Philippians chapter 2, let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it. Now that we know that we're not to just use grace as a license to sin, let's take a look at what this looks like practically in our lives. Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter... You guys still doing okay? I know this is a lot. I, I understand. I know. I am just unleashing. It's like taking a drink out of a fire hose. I get it, okay? God will enlarge your capacity, and there's seeds that are going to be planted tonight that won't come to fruition for some time in your life. Because we're all growing, we're all learning, we're all walking this life out and learning how to live. And that's where I, I'm saying, listen, it would be easy to say grace covers it all, just do whatever you want to do. But then we, we why well, come to church, right? We just shut the doors after praise and worship because we felt good about ourselves and then we leave. See, this takes work, doesn't it? And we hate that. I, I don't want to work. I work all day. I want to come to church and feel good about myself. Well, listen, you can feel good about himself. Because you're in Christ, and you are a saint. You are sanctified. You are holy. And guess what? You can feel good that, you know what? I'm not the same man I used to be. I'm not the same woman I used to be. I used to be a sinner, but now I'm a saint. Now let's learn how to live like a saint. You are a king. You are a priest. And now let's learn how to act like it. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12, and verse number 13. Therefore, my beloved, you know who the beloved are. Those are people who are in Christ Jesus. We are the beloved. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, look at what he says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Pastor, hold on, I got a question. I thought we weren't supposed to work for our salvation. I thought it was a free gift. Yes, it is. But he's not saying work for your salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, what has gone on on the inside you, let it out of you, right? Work out your salvation. In other words, I'm saved. Now I'm going to do this. You know, it's like I, I was, I got some, some, some of you guys, uh, I'm following you guys on Instagram. I'm watching. <laughs> and, uh, and some of the brothers are into working out, right? And so uh, one day somebody was posting about don't be hating on somebody who's trying, you know, to, 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 to eat right. And, you know, they're just getting started on their journey and this and that because, you know, there are people who are hating on those that, that are just getting started at the new year with their resolutions, you know. And, and the point of what they were saying was like, hey, listen, give them some grace. Give them some, some encouragement. Don't, don't like be like, oh, yeah, we were working out way before you thought it was cool, you know. And that seems to be the attitude of some. Like, hey, you know what? Uh, what? Thanks for joining the party. Finally showing up, that sort of a thing. But really what they were saying is, no, let, let's, let's encourage them. Let's, let's help them on their journey. Let, let's, let's do that. Let, let's work out, you know. You, you, you are somebody who is now into fitness. You are now into health. That's good. Keep going. Keep learning. Keep growing. Keep doing what you need to do. Keep eating right. Keep, keep doing, uh, you know, posting about that stuff and keep, keep after it. That sort of a thing. I, I think that's really what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, guys, you, you know what? You guys were obedient when I was there. But now that I'm gone, and now that we've set up systems in the church, and now that I'm writing to you, listen, much more in my absence, you guys are saved. You got this, okay? Now, work that out of your lives. Allow yourselves to let it come out of you. And, 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 and how do we do that? Next verse, look at what he says. Verse number 13. For it is God who works in you. Oh, wait a second. I, I was working out my salvation with fear and trembling. But it's God who works in you. Once again, we have a dual reality. I'm working, and God's working. Not just grace, not just works, but both of them coming together, God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. I'm not going to frustrate the grace of God. I'm not going to receive the grace of God in vain. I'm not going to do nothing with what God has given me. No, I'm going to work together with the grace of God. God's working in my life. God's changing me. But guess what? I'm getting on board with what God is doing. I'm going to help him out as much as I can. 
in every way that I can. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, you will will it. What does that mean? You will want to do what God wants you to do as you allow the grace of God to work inside of you. But not only will you want to do it, desire is one thing, but then you will also work towards that end, both to will and to do. One thing to want it, another thing to do it. I know a lot of people say, I want to be holy. I want to get rid of this stuff. This stuff's been dragging me down. You don't know the desires that I have. and I, I, I want what God wants for my life, and then they do nothing with it. But as you allow the grace of God on the inside of your life and you start to clean up your act and you start to work together with the grace of God, now all of a sudden, God starts to change those desires. That sin nature, you realize it for what it is. And you realize that's not me. That's the sin nature warring against my spirit. Me is the real me. Me is the saint. But the the sinful flesh that was crucified, that dead man's rising up like a zombie right now trying to tell me what I'm going to do. But I'm not going to let it. I'm going to put that flesh under, and guess what? I don't want that anymore. God's changing me. He's changing my desires from the inside out. And now, as I recognize that temptation, as I recognize that feeling, I can say no, and I can do what God would have me to do. I can be sanctified. I can live my sanctification. I can be holy, exclusively His. That's what this is all about. I like how Tony Cook defined responsibility. He says it's our response to God's ability. We're to work together with God's grace for our sanctification. How does this look? Sanctification by grace. A couple of things, okay? Sanctification by grace. I'm going to finish this sentence a couple times tonight. Sanctification by grace, number one, starts with the truth of God's word. If we are going to be sanctified, if we're going to have those desires, those God desires on the inside of our lives, then we have to know the truth of what God says about us. John chapter 17, verse number 17, pretty easy to remember, right? John chapter 17, verse number 17. Turn there with me. Gospel of John chapter number 17, verse number 17. Jesus is praying to the Father. He's praying for you and he's praying for me. Pretty amazing to think about. These are the prayers of Jesus for us. Guess what? He's in heaven and he's still interceding on our behalf. He ever lives to make intercession on our behalf. Look at what he says in verse number 17 of John 17. He says, sanctify them, set them apart, make them holy. How? How? By your truth. And then he defines truth. Your word is truth. See, oftentimes we say, well, no, that's not truth. My experience is what's truth for me. No, it's not. Word of God is truth. Your experience is your experience. Well, there are facts. You know, we, we've got scientific facts. We've got, uh, you know, natural facts. We've got numerical facts. We've got economic facts. We, there are facts. Yes, there are, but those are not the truth because they're not the word of God. See, there is a difference between the facts and the truth. Fact is, you messed up. Truth is, you're a saint, sanctified, holy. So what do I do with that? You work together with the truth of God to get your practice in line with your position. Kings don't mess their pants. Kings don't slide down the rails. Kings don't talk like that. Kings act a different way. You are nobility. You are royalty. It's time to clean up our act. The only way you're going to do that is with the word of God. We've all had struggles, amen? I know I have. I've struggled with things. I remember struggling and praying and wondering why God didn't just do it for me. Listen, here's why. Because God was changing me from the inside out. I had to get the word of God for my situation. There was wrong thinking that I had. You know, when you come up against a thing, you know, men, oftentimes we struggle with pride. We struggle with lust. We struggle with all sorts of things, right? And and so here I am, and I'm having to find the verses on pride. I'm having to find the verses on lust, you know, and then have an argument with somebody, and all of a sudden I'm finding the verses on how to argue properly, right? See, the more you get experience in life, the more you see what's going on, you're going to have to run to the word. There's only one way that you're going to be set apart and holy unto the Lord, and that is by the truth of what God's word has to say about you. You have to know who you are in Christ. You have to know what God says. You have to know the word of God. You have to have the truth that sets you apart. See, we are in the world, but we are to live holy, exclusive to God, and it's what sets us apart and makes us different than everyone else is our noble birth. We have to learn who we are in Christ and what God expects of us, and that is Christ in us. 
It's a walk of faith. And the more you get the word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? So therefore, this is how this works. You have a situation. You look at what the word of God has to say. You get the word of God on it. You believe it. You confess it over your lives and you start to live it out to the best of your ability. That's where the grace of God sanctifies you by his truth. God starts to move on your behalf. Sanctification by grace, second thing is this, it's seen in our lifestyle. People are going to know something's different about you, that you are set apart, that you are holy when they look at your life. If they can't see that yet, then that just means that you need to work together with the truth of God's word in the sanctifying process. Romans chapter 6, once again, turn, the, turn back there with me to Romans chapter 6. And in Romans chapter 6, verse number 19, look at what he says. Romans chapter 6, verse number 19. He says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Oh, thank God he does that, right? Because we all need to understand these things. And so he says, let me, let me, let me dip down and come down a, a notch and speak in these terms so that you understand what I'm talking about. He says, for just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So he says, we have a choice each and every day of our life who we present ourselves to. Are we going to present our members, our limbs, our bodies, our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, our emotions? Are we going to present ourselves as members of unrighteousness? Are we going to yield to those things and allow those things to lord over us? Or are we going to present ourselves and our members as slaves of righteousness for the end of being holy, set apart for God? See, where you present yourself, when you wake up in the morning, it should be that you pray and you say to God, God, today, I'm your person. I'm your man. I'm your girl. I'm your woman. Lord, I'm set apart. I'm holy. I am called. I'm chosen by Almighty God. You have a calling on my life. You have a purpose. God, you're working in me to willing to do your good pleasure. God, there's some desires that I have inside of me that don't line up with your word. I've seen them. God, change those desires. Start working in me, and God, I'll do what it takes. Sometimes it takes making hard decisions, but it'll be seen in your life. Not only in just, the, I believe the word of God is true. A lot of people believe the word of God is true. They're still shacking up. They're still not getting married. They're still smoking whatever they want to smoke. They're sniffing whatever they want to sniff. They're drinking whatever they want to drink. They're watching whatever they want to watch, and there is no holiness. They look like everybody else in the world. And I know this is not a popular message. There's some of you not going to come back to this church because this preacher told you, I can't do what I want to do. Listen, I'm going to go do me and grace will cover it. Well, go back to the scripture and you can learn that on your own then. Or you can go out there in the world and let the devil kick your butt and come crawling back and realize that this is truth. But it's going to be seen in your lifestyle. But guess what else? God doesn't leave you alone in this. This is not all on you. Remember, we're talking about grace. This is God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. Pastor, I've got addictions. You don't understand the, the, the strength of the sin that's grabbed a hold of my life. I am literally addicted. I'm obsessed, and I don't know how to get out from underneath it. The grace of God is how you're going to get out from underneath it. The grace of God can deliver you, can break that thing off of you. It can change your heart. It can change your desire. I know because at age 15 years old, with a mouth like a sailor, I gave my heart and life to Jesus, and the very next day, until today, I can count on the number of hands how many times I have cussed. It was an instantaneous, bang, deliverance. God has the power to deliver you. Now, some of you might say, well, that discourages me, Pastor, because God hasn't done that for me yet. Well, guess what? There were other things in my life that at age 15, as a young man, I struggled with, that I kept on struggling with after I got saved. That meant I had to get the truth of God's word, I had to start living it out and, and letting it manifest in my life, and I had to let the word of God sanctify me and set me apart. See, the grace of God, last thing for tonight, empowers purity. The grace of God empowers purity. The world will spot you. The world will stain you. And if you allow yourself to continually and habitually sin, it will produce death in your life. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? Does that mean I'm going to die spiritually? Does that mean I'm going to die physically? Let me ask you a question. Do you care which one? I mean, really? Do you want to die physically? No, no one would say that. No, we want to live, right? We want to live out our days in health and strength and then go to be with Jesus someday. But we certainly don't want to die spiritually, if that's what that means. And so either way, it's bad. So 
Why not allow the grace of God to empower us to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, to set us apart and to purify us, keeping us unspotted? You know, the Apostle Paul said, I know whom I have entrusted for that day. He is able to keep what I have given to him. Spotless, blameless, and pure. It empowers purity. 2 Corinthians, turn there with me, chapter 7, verse number 1. 2 Corinthians, chapter 7, verse number 1. Last couple of scriptures for tonight. Coming in for a landing, hallelujah. I know this is a lot, guys. You guys are doing great. The apostle has just written to the Corinthian church, and he's told them that God has promises for them. He says, come out from among them and be separate. Be holy to me as a people. I will be your God, and you will be my people. In chapter 7, verse 1, he says, therefore, in other words, because of the promises, because of what I just said, therefore, having these promises, beloved, once again, he's speaking to the beloved, he's speaking to the people who are in Christ. He says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, I want to point out something that the apostle did not say. He did not say, let God clean up your life. Okay? Now we know the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, right? Not some sin, not most of our sin, but all sin. Again, positionally you are holy. But here, there's a practice. There's a practical sanctification. There's a living out of this holiness that we have to make ourselves exclusively his. So he says, therefore having these promises, beloved, let who? Us. Cleanse ourselves. You have a part to play in this. If there are things in your life that you know are spotting you, staining you, wrinkling you, making you any less holy, if there's something in your bedroom underneath your bed that no one knows about except for you, if there's something in the trunk of your car right now that you need to go and destroy, if there are ungodly associations or attachments, then the Bible says, let us. God's not going to do it. God's not going to do it for you. You have a responsibility to work together with the grace of God. You have been cleansed. You're a king. You're a priest. Let's start acting like it. Let us cleanse us ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness and notice he says perfecting holiness listen guys we love you and we will love you while you change I understand that not everything happens instantaneously like the cussing right that I talked about there are things that we have to struggle through. There are things that we have to grow to so that we can go to. There are things that God is working in us. There are desires that it's going to take some time. We at this church will love you while you work together with the grace of God and while you change. Listen, everybody in the room is an ex-something. Ex-drug addict, ex-pimp, ex-ho, ex-extortioner. I mean, we got ex-mafia men that come to this church. We got ex-murderers. We got ex-rapists. We got ex-everything. Listen, God is not in therapy. He's not taking Prozac. God doesn't uh, wonder and stay up at night and lose sleep about your sin. God knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. And he knows how he's going to get you out of it. He knows where he's leading you. But you've got to work together with the grace of God. And it doesn't make it okay to keep doing it just because God knows about it. Well, God knows about grace. God says, stupid. <laughs> Produces death. We're perfecting holiness. We're, we're working this thing out. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I just want to hit this one real quick. Uh, very important that we understand this m many times in the word of God. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Many times in the, in the Bible, you will find that your holiness, one of the biggest uh, disruptors of holiness, is sexual purity. That's one of the things that anytime somebody mentions in church, people, right, they freeze. Nobody move. Nobody make a noise. Don't look anywhere. They're going to think it's you. First Thessalonians, chapter number four, verse number three. For this is the will of God. Sometimes people say, what's the will of God for my life? This is part of the will of God for your life. This is something that you should do. This is in the New Testament. This is not the law. This is how we're to act under grace. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. See, he's saying there's people out there 
And remember, Thessalonians, this is people that are not Jews. But he said the other people that don't have a covenant with God, they act however they want to act. They lust however they want to lust. Guys, they did not have the internet and the things that we deal with today. They had temple prostitutes that they could go and have sex out in the open in front of a temple with a prostitute. There were things that they dealt with that we don't deal with in our lives. But the principle is this. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should be holy. And he says, you should know how to possess your own vessel. You should know how to act. You should know how to govern yourself. You are a spirit who lives in a body, and you should be the one piloting that body under the grace, the authority, and the power of God. You should know how to do this. Not like the rest of the world. In other words, don't just fit in. Just because everybody else thinks it's okay to masturbate and to look at pornography and to do all that kind of stuff doesn't make it okay for you. You are different. You are royalty. You are a priest. You are a king. It's time to act differently than the rest of the world. That if each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Verse 6, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Verse 7, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. God called us to be separate. God called us to be sanctified. God called us to be different. If you're having sex outside of marriage, stop it! If you're committing adultery, stop. Repent. Because the Bible says the Lord is the avenger. You do not want God against you. That's how serious this is. And the Bible says that fornicators and adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Not popular. But this is what the word of God has to say. We have to line up with the word of God. If you're looking at pornography, it's time to repent. If you have to give someone else your password to the computer, if you have to turn in your smartphone for a dumb phone, do what you got to do. If your arm is causing you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out. That's what it's talking about. Do what it takes to get that away from you and get that off of you. That's your sanctification. That's where you live. We're called to be exclusively God's people. We're called to be different. We're called to be peculiar. They're going to be wanting to go rush and jump into all this stuff. Come on to the bar with us. We're going drinking. Afterwards, we're going to go over to somebody's house. They got a bowl. We're going to smoke it together. You guys go ahead. Have fun. What's wrong with you? You used to be cool. You used to kick it. You used to hang. Man, what, what happened to you? Church made you soft. Yeah, it did. It softened my heart towards the things of God. I'm living for the Lord now. We're called to be exclusively God's. We're to come up to his ways. See, his ways are higher than our ways. We don't often understand it. Sometimes it, we, we don't understand it, but it, it's difficult. And we wonder why, God, what's going on? And it isn't until later on when we mature and when we grow that we start to see the fruit of our labors and what it is that God's doing. So we renew our minds to the word of God as we come up to his ways. Now, all of a sudden, we are exclusive to him. We go above the rest. We can only do that with the power that he gives This is not something that can happen in the natural. You cannot wage war against sin and be sanctified on your own power. It's a thing that happens instantaneously. It's an event, but it's also a process that happens in your life. It's something that God is bringing you through. It's progressive in your life. You will be more and more God's, more and more exclusively his. Guys, I've been in the service of the Lord for over 20 years now. And I know that throughout my journey that God has brought me to some amazing things and it's not over yet. I am not, I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. I am perfecting holiness. I'm still learning this. I'm still living this. I'm still cleaning up my act. I'm still getting things out of my life. I, I'm staying accountable to my wife. I'm staying accountable to people, pastors on this staff and this team. There, there's people that are mentors to me that I'm accountable to that I talk to about my heart and say, hey, you know what? This just came out of me. Was I okay? Did, did I say that wrong? You know, I don't want to be prideful. I don't want to be angry with everybody. I, you know what? I don't want to be crushed under pressure and weight help me see we're all in this guys and we're all growing in the ways of God we got to get a hold of his truth his word is what sanctifies us his truth we've got to allow it to flow we got to yield ourselves and allow it to be seen in our lives and then we have to allow his power to empower us to purify ourselves. We've got to work together with the grace of God. If you got something that you need to get rid of, go do it. If you've got to cut something off, cut it off. It's okay. God will take care of you and God will fulfill you and God will do greater things than you ever thought. You are exclusively His by the grace of God. Can you say amen and give the Lord a praise tonight?
Everybody take a deep breath in. <sighs> deep breath out. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. That's a good word. That's solid. That's healthy. Not because I preached it, but because it's the word of the Lord. Tonight, I'm going to ask everybody to remain seated. I'm going to ask every head bowed, every eye closed at this time. Tonight, some of you in this room, if you were to die, you would die and go to hell. You've never given God all of your heart, and you've never given God all of your life. Yeah, you're sitting in church, but church doesn't get you saved. It's not about church attendance. Like we talked about tonight, it's not about works. You can't do enough good. It's not about being raised in church or being born in America. Just because you're born in America doesn't mean that you're Christian headed for heaven. Sometimes people think that if they know enough about God, that if they can quote scriptures, if they can understand the scriptures, that that makes them a Christian. Celebrate Christmas and Easter. Maybe even memorize scriptures. But listen, the demons and the devil believe that Jesus Christ is in God. They're not Christians. The Bible records the devil can quote scriptures and yet that doesn't make him a Christian. It's not about what you have in your head. This is not about your good works, but this is about your heart. Jesus said you must be born again. Now the world would like to make that out to be a mockery, but really what being born again means is that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life and there's no other way you're gonna go to heaven unless you are born again. I'm asking everybody to remain seated, please, during this time. This is very serious. Some of you are going to hell and you're walking out of this place. You don't even care. But I love you enough to get in your face and tell you the truth. Please, please don't disturb anybody around you. Please, at this time, remain seated. I'll let you go in three minutes. I want to make sure that you don't end up in hell, but that you go to heaven. The only way that you're going to do that is by being born again. What does being born again mean? It means you've given God all of your heart, and it means you've given God all of your life. If you haven't yet done that, you're not saved. There has to be a surrendering. There has to be that moment that you say, I believe in Jesus' work on my behalf and I'm going to give him all my heart. I'm going to give him all of my life and I receive that gift. It's called being born again. God recreates you on the inside. He forgives you and washes you clean of all of your sin by the power of his blood that was shed on the cross. It doesn't happen because of good works. It doesn't happen because of church attendance. It happens because you surrender it to him. And tonight, I'm going to pray a prayer to receive Jesus into your heart. And tonight, if you want to be included in that prayer, in a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang. All you have to do to be included in that prayer is simply raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down after you know that I've counted it. And then... For those of you who say, I want to pray that prayer. I want to be born again tonight. I'll bring you up here and we'll pray together. You say, well, maybe I'll be embarrassed if that happens. Listen, Jesus went to the cross, beaten bloody public spectacle. And he said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right. Or give God all of your heart and all of your life in this safe and friendly place. Come forward and receive this free gift. And we'll pray together. Tonight is your night of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight is your night. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, what does that mean? Half-hearted. A little in, little out, little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. Occasional church attendance. God's something in your life, but he's not everything. Listen, you're not going to make it because Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot. Or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit from my mouth. Half-hearted Christianity is no real Christianity at all. And if I just described you, come on, let's go for God tonight. Get ready to get your hand up. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television in the foyer, down in the cafe, or online, wherever you're at, all over the world. Get ready to get your hand up. God sees and God's watching. You can be included in this prayer as well. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. And if that's you, you want to be included in this prayer. Receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, giving him all of your heart and all of your life. Get ready to get your hands up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. There's one. Thank you. Who else? Don't clap. Don't clap. Let's give people this private moment. There's two. There's three. There's four. Got you guys. Who else tonight? There's four. There's five. There's six. Got you over here. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Want to give God all your heart and all of your life? Start that process we talked about tonight. Thank you. Got you. Seven, eight. Got you over there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Eight. Down here somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, I got him right there. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Who else tonight? Anybody else real quick that I did not already see? Got you up there. Thank you. Thank you, number nine. Number 10, where you at? 
Come on, just lift it up high if that's you. Need to give God all your heart. Need to give God all your life. Simply raise your hand, then we'll pray together. Who else tonight? Anybody else? You said, I want to be included in that prayer. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else that I did not already see? I want to make sure that you're included in this prayer. Up there, thank you. Number 10, God bless you. Right here, number 11, thank you. Down on this side. I think they were pointing over here. All right, praise God. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, just one more moment, then we're going to wrap this thing up. There's been 11 or 12 wise people. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. Okay, quickly, quickly, quickly. Those of you that raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, but you didn't, it's not too late. I want you to get a hold of your cold purse, sweater, Bible, a friend of you, and a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. We're going to change destinies tonight. We're going to pray together. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you're sitting next to somebody, just nudge them. Say, hey, did you raise your hand? I'll go with you. Come on, friend, let's go. And you come right now. Let's pray. Come on, come on, come on. Come on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. From the family rooms, if your children raise their hand, you can bring them at this time. They're welcome. Come on down. From the foyer, if you're out there and you were listening to my voice and you raise your hand out there, come on in right now. This is your time. This is your moment. Come on. Come on, let's keep it going for them. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. All right. Well, half of you showed up. The rest of you guys, hey, I'm going to still pray that prayer. If you're serious about God, listen, don't start it in disobedience. That's, that's not what we talked about that. We talked about obedience and that sort of thing. And so maybe you didn't understand or maybe you think I'm tricking you. I told you I was going to pray with you. So listen, we're going to pray this prayer right now, okay, guys? Everybody up front, put a smile on your face. It's a good thing, all right? Not a bad thing. Can you give God all your heart, all of your life? Going to be born again. Brand new start, brand new heart right here, right now, okay? Now, listen, I'm going to pray simple phrases to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again. Now, if you mess up on a couple of words, it's okay, all right? This is not about the words of your mouth. This is about the prayer of your heart right now. So let's go before the Lord tonight. And everybody, bow your heads, close your eyes, say these words out loud together with me. Say, Father God, I come to you now in Jesus' name. I give you all of my heart and all my life. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me with your blood. And let it be known that from this day on, I am a Christian. I'm born again. I'm a king's kid. I'm headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. My process of sanctification starts right now. Help me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise tonight. All right. Now listen, we want to help you, okay? We don't just want to leave you there. Okay, what do I do now that I'm a Christian? I don't really know. It's kind of awkward. Everybody's here, all right? What do we do? I got a friend I want to introduce you to. Right over here, my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel. He wants to give you some free information, some free literature, find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? And also talk to you about a program we have where someone will come alongside you and encourage you. Five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible. It's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works. He'll let you come right back out. Take a couple minutes of your time, okay? And then he'll let you come right back out. So if you guys make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right this way. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.